This week, the Security Weekly crew celebrates our 10th anniversary. We're celebrating in style, so stay tuned for interviews with Miko Hipponen, Ron Gula, former members of The Loft, panel discussions on bug bounties and mobile security. We'll do a little bit of reflecting, hear some listener voicemails, play some hacker trivia, all that and more from the show you've been loving and hating for the past 10 years and for the next 10 and beyond. So buckle up, tray tables in the full and upright position, drinks in hand, it's going to be an epic ride. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, the show where exploits run wild. Packets aren't the only things getting sifted. Systems aren't the only things getting penetrated. Functions are the only things getting wrapped. Bits aren't the only things getting banged. And the cocktails, they're going to flow steady as soon as Apollo gets back. Now, fire up a packet capture, pour yourself an adult beverage, and give the intern control of your botnet because here's your host, a man who made this all possible with a little bit of help from his friends, Paul Asadori. Welcome, everyone, to Security <laughs> Weekly. This is our 10th year anniversary show, otherwise known as episode 438. It sounds better, I think, when I, I think say 10-year yeah. anniversary show. <laughs> yes. so Absolutely. It's wonderful to be here uh, with everyone, uh, or most of us. There's been a lot of wow. people in the past involved with the show. These are the people today that are involved in the show. And, uh, of course, it's not possible without all of you, all of our fabulous listeners. And uh, we've got most of us here in studio. We're yeah. very excited about that. Yeah. And when you look at that, look at, look at how small that is. Look at, look at the job. title. We're all pointing at Job, but look how small that, that's it is. That's a really small target for pouring your beer into. It's, Isn't it's it? The Titan. The Titan. The Titan. 17.59 gigaflops wow. of pure did, cracking power. How did Joff get next to me? Uh, yeah, I don't my know. beverage is wet. <laughs> and, and you got it next to your lighter. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's just going to be left. fire. It's so much easier. Cause, cause just smart. Because <laughs> Larry is smart. He's I'm like, I could sit. No. No. <laughs> my, my, my daughter volunteered her middle school supercomputer for me to use today. Isn't that wonderful? Wasn't that kind of her? That's very kind That's of her. She kind. knows uh, she's not getting it back, right? So just, <laughs> to, introduce, just to introduce everyone, Mr. John Strand is here. Hello, everybody. Larry Pesci Woo! is here. Joff Thire. Not Kevin, <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Mann. Welcome, everyone. Oh, wait, we've On the guys, lines well, via Skype, it, Mr. Michael... St oh, no. Michael Santar Calangelo is not... And oh, behind, he, behind, the behind the bar. Did somebody set the alarm? Oh, behind the bar. Apollo. Yeah. Apollo. We, there's no bar. Yeah. Smile for the camera that's not now, working. Are we ordering, <laughs> are we ordering drinks from him? Or yes. is he just going to bring us random shit for the, throughout the day? And he's going to bring us random shit. Bring us something. I like that. Just okay. bring it in. Just bring something. <laughs> Just basically be like, here, drink this, and then we'll do that in between drinks a shot, a shot. Of really quick, the only sponsors that I wanted to read for this particular segment, I want to remind everyone to donate to the EFF. Mm. If you go to securityweekly.com forward slash 10 year, 10 year, 10 year, securityweekly.com slash 10 year, you'll get to the show notes. There's a link in there to donate to the, e excuse me, the EFF, or you can just go to EFF.org and click the donate button. Please do that. I like to choose a cause that we can all stand behind. EFF is the one that we've chosen to uh, to do that. So and, as and John has harassed the EFF just quite enough. So yes. Yes. They, they finally told me I donated enough money to make it still not okay. Well, I still <laughs> have to keep going. And speaking of John, there's a, there's another cause that uh, that uh, Joff, Larry, and I are interested in. John is in need of a cat carrier. <laughs> so if anybody out there has a spare cat carrier that they want to yes. donate, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later. We'll, that'll come up later. Okay. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, uh, <laughs> they've already got go, GoFundMe.com. Go John's cat me. carrier. <laughs> and on the same note, we're trying to get Larry an, an H1 Hummer. Um, it's either so that or a deuce and a half. Take one of those pick. deuce and a half. It's one of those two. So. Wow. Coffee is so much better with whiskey. In it. <laughs> 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 Wait, amazing. Huh? How is I, that? I stole so? some of John's and I dumped it in my coffee. <laughs> it's better that than Joff's computer. Jesus. Hey, it just booted up too. That's really <laughs> <It's>, amazing. <laughs> you started it last night and it's booted <laughs> up. <now. laughs> yeah. Do you remember when those? Was that everyone Windows ninety five? Right. <laughs> everyone had those and they were running backtrack on them and they're like, look at this. Isn't dude, this cool? Dude, I'm like, oh, that, that was dude, an awful dude, year to travel I, through I airports with. 
three of those. I have three of those. Two of them for my ham radio stuff, and one. And in if the you Jeep. had four, you'd have a full laptop. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To, to, kick, to kick things off today, we're going to start by interviewing none other than Miko Hipponen, the chief research officer at F Secure Corporation in Finland. He started programming on a Commodore 64 and has been reverse engineering malware since they were spreading on floppies. He's known for tracking down the <laughs> authors of the first PC virus in history. PC World ranked him among the 50 most important people on the web. He has 110 Twitter followers, and his <laughs> AMA made the front page of Reddit. But most importantly, he's the world champion in Xavius. Did I say that right? Xevious. Xevious? Xevious, the arcade game. Miko, welcome to Security Weekly. Oh, boy, thank you very much. Thank you for having me, and congratulations on the 10th anniversary. Thank you very much, Miko. It's nice to meet you. Uh, we've never chatted before, so it's wonderful to we've have you on the show. We've actually met once face to face in some events somewhere, but you were very drunk. <laughs> <laughs> How well, could that, that, that narrow is it down? <laughs> I can assure you that never happens. <laughs> and I can Today. also assure you I have no recollection of that. <laughs> so, so, Miko, how did you get your... Oh, just let me tell you, it's, it's always good to meet people who also have a hard-to-pronounce last name. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, mine is not all hard to pronounce, but it's also difficult to spell. And yes. Most people like to spell it on, wrong on purpose with two S's. So right. A-S-S. <laughs> which Adorian. is interesting because my middle name is Jack. But <laughs> <laughs> Miko, how did you get your start in information security? Um... Well, I was studying programming 25 years ago, and I needed a place to go and do some, some, you know, some something to work at to get some money while I was studying. So I got <coughs> recruited to this small startup to do some database development, and that startup turned out to be a company called Data Fellows, which then, mm. much later, renamed itself to F Secure, and uh, turns out I'm still here. So if you want career advice from somebody, don't take any career advice from me. I've been working here forever. So you, you started there when you were in college, when they were under a different name, is that correct? That's correct. The company was called Data Fellows because it was doing all kinds of things, not just yes. security things. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the first program I was hired to, to program here was a program for a factory to do porcelain manufacturing process, which had really nothing wow. to do with security. But one of the things we were doing already you know, in the early 1990s were security training, and then that turned into people asking for guidance on security software, on antivirus, which led me to becoming an antivirus analyst because I had reverse engineering knowledge and assembly knowledge from my early days on a 8-bit computer. So uh, you know, it just all added up, and I'm here. <clears throat> so uh, what were some of the early viruses like that you were analyzing? Let's go back in history and start there. Uh, <laughs> well, the very first one was the first virus I ever named, which uh, I named Omega. And this was in 1991. I, was, I spent quite a while analyzing one single virus, which was sent to us by one of our early customers, of course, sent on a floppy disk, five and a quarter inch floppy disk. Hmm. And to just put this into perspective, these were such an early days that we didn't actually have computers we could infect because computers were expensive and if you infect one you might not be able to recover it so i just printed out the code on paper on a stack of paper <laughs> oh, <laughs> spent two days going through it and uh, had a uh, ralph brown's interrupt list printed for cross-referencing and uh, and I, I i thought i figured it out that on the 13th every every time it's friday the 13th it would display one character on screen and i was looking as key tables for which character is it and i figured out it's the omega character. So I named the malware Omega. And then maybe six months later, we had enough money, we could actually buy a separate computer just to get it infected. So I infected with this malware and I changed the date to Friday the 13th of whatever month. And I ran the malware and it did display the Omega sign. So I got it right. I was really happy about that. Oh, that's really <laughs> cool. So uh, over the course of time, what are some of the more memorable virus outbreaks uh, that you can recall? <sighs> Well, in the early days, the outbreaks were very slow because they were spreading on floppies. Mm. So, you know, how fast can you go when people have to travel with your malware? It wasn't that hectic. But then when the web came around and when email, email became commonplace, we started seeing these massive outbreaks of email worms and, and web worms. Um, one of the early cases I remember very, very fondly is the Sobic family because we were analyzing it. Actually, in this very lab where I'm sitting right now, we've been here since since uh, 2000, and Sobic was probably around 2001. Wow. And uh, and we were um, 
trying to figure trying to figure out the command and control center for Sobic, uh, probably Sobic.f. And at that time, um, when we finally like reverse engineered the malware, found this encoded block and cracked the encryption and got the IP address for the CNC server, we knew we had to shut it down because the malware had this programmed date that it would get some instructions from that server and execute them. And uh, we had like 24 hours to go to shut it down. And uh, when we got it, when we cracked the code, we tried to send an email to our friends at Certify, the government regulator, which would actually have some hand in shutting down these servers. And when we sent our email to them, it bounced because there were so many emails sent by SoBigF all over the world. <coughs> emails were falling down. So um, then we tried faxing them, but of course they didn't have a fax because it's, you know, faxes are, are well, well, I think they had a fax. Yeah, they asked us to fax them the list of IP addresses, but we didn't have a fax anymore because faxes are ancient technology. So then I actually printed out the list of IP addresses and handed it to one of our guys who started actually driving to the regulator who's like two miles away. And there was a traffic jam and he got stuck in the traffic jam. And then he actually, you know, left his car and ran to the regulator to get the list. And, and we started shutting down the IP addresses. And it, it felt like, at the time, it felt like a really heroic stunts. And it was like... Yeah, it sounds know, like a Hollywood movie plot. We saved the world. That's what it felt like. Uh, but now when we look back at it, it actually wasn't that big a case. We've seen much, much worse since mm -hmm. then. Um, so I, I want to talk about, did F-Secure do the response for the Kabir worm? Kabir, yeah, that was the first mobile phone worm. And now just to put things into perspective, um, that was in 19, hold on, 2000 and when was Kabir? When was Kabir there? Is that still ten in your course? Ten, 10 years ago? I want to say 2004, yes. wasn't it? Um, 1990... No. Nine, 1990? Eight. Was really? it that early on? Because it, no, uh, it made its uh, debut at the World fourth... Cup? So fourth or tenth World Athletics Championships in Helsinki. Yeah, I remember that because I was on location there. I yeah. just can't remember the year. But That's it was, just it was, like uh, down the street from them. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that, yeah. was the, that was kind of the point, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, the, um, to, to, I mean, the, the scenario around all of this time, of course, is that all the mobile phones everybody was having at the time were made by this one company called Nokia, mm -hmm. which is headquartered roughly three miles away from where I am right now. Right. So it, it, it's a matter of national pride. When a baby is born, they hand a Nokia phone to the baby in the basket. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, and also, the, the, the way we name our babies is, is that you, you take the... Uh, you give it the name, then you take a MIME64 hash out of the name and you name it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the law. And that, <laughs> that, ladies and gentlemen, is why America sucks. <laughs> <laughs> now... Um, We've, all, of course, always been very close to Nokia because it's, it's a huge technology company coming out of a country of 5 million people. Uh, in fact, the guy who started F-Secure, a guy called Risto Silasma, who's uh, still our chairman, he's actually nowadays also the chairman of the board of, of, for Nokia. So we are, you know, close. And at the time of these early viruses for mobile devices like Kabir and Comwarrior, they were all for Nokia-based devices, which were all running Symbian as the operating mm. system at the time. And just to put things into perspective, Symbian sucked. It was really bad, really slow, kept crashing, had no memory, and the security model was, was awful, especially the Bluetooth security model. So Kabir was a worm spreading from one Symbian phone, basically one Nokia phone, to another Nokia phone by beaming itself over in, in Bluetooth messages. And... Uh, yeah, it was a pretty big deal back then when it was found because we had been expecting for the first mobile phone worms for quite a while already, and then it actually appeared. And it was actually coming from a group called 29A. It was this hobbyist hacker gang which was publishing a magazine online and publishing all kinds of, you know, firsts in different viruses. Like, you know, first mobile phone virus was exactly in their in their neighborhood or in, in their expertise, and, and that's what they did. And uh, then that started the whole avalanche of mobile phone attacks, which we are still seeing today, although, of course, now they are not on, so on Symbian or Nokia platforms, right. but mostly on Android. Do, we, do you see a lot of malware, Miko, that um, okay, spreads via the same mechanism like Bluetooth? No, Bluetooth isn't really a vector at all anymore. And why, or, why is that? Is that? Did we actually secure? Bluetooth? I find that hard to mm. believe. 
Well, we've, we've changed it enough that it, it killed the basic functionality of the early Bluetooth worms. Um, well, just last month, we had this vulnerability for <laughs> iPhones where you could actually use AirDrop to drop yes. a binary yes. over an iPhone. And that, yeah. was a, I, I, that AirDrop is Bluetooth. We didn't actually see an outbreak with it, but mm -hmm. uh, the vulnerability could have easily been used to create an iPhone worm. So um, they are not completely out of out of the realm of possibility, but in the real world, we aren't actually see, seeing them. In fact, uh, right across from the room where I'm sitting in right now, we have a Faraday cage, what we call an <laughs> RF lab, an actual actual room. We've built two rooms at the time of these Bluetooth worms, just so we had a place where we could safely analyze these Bluetooth worms spreading on these early phones, but we aren't actually using it for any Bluetooth analysis anymore because we don't really see Bluetooth worms right. because of the way Bluetooth worm works today. It's, it's yeah. just different. But there's an interesting thing about what I said about Android. Like, in the early days, all the mobile phone worms were on Nokia devices, which is coming out of Finland, and of course now they are on Android devices. And Android turns out to be by far the most popular distribution of Linux. And Linux, of course, is also coming from Finland. The That's Linux right. kernel originally developed by Linus Torvalds right here at the Helsinki University. Mm. Uh, Miko, who's the most successful online criminal that you've seen in your lifetime You know, working for Epstra? I'm sure in analyzing a lot of this malware leads you to looking at uh, how criminals operate uh, online. I actually do spend quite a bit of time analyzing the enemy, trying to figure out where the attacks come from and the various enemy groups, like whether they are criminals or hacktivist gangs or you know governmental players. Because I strongly do believe that we have no hope in defending our systems if we don't understand who we are playing against. Um, but I guess the most successful guys I can't name because the most successful guys haven't been caught. Um, I, was, I was hoping you would answer with that, yes. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, if I have to name some, some operations which probably have been very successful and have made a lot of money for criminal actors, um, well, these ransom Trojan gangs, Crypto Wall, Crypto Defense, Re Reveton, Urusoi, these are all, all Russian gangs operating from St. Petersburg and, and Moscow. They've made shitloads with these ransomware attacks uh, because, of, because they're doing crypto right. I mean, you can't. And because people pay the ransom. Obviously. Yeah. Well, that's what whenever I have family members that say I got hit by this, they say, "What do you recommend I do?" I'm like, "Pay them." Yeah. Yeah. Really? I mean, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Almost single-handedly responsible for the uh, escalation in price of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yep. Hmm. And and of course, the they, the recommendation works because if you actually pay them, you will get your files back. So they do the crypto right. You can't brute force your files, but they will be able to provide you with the private key. And if you pay them, they will actually provide you with the private key. And they make a trend. Um, that really made this possible, of course, is Bitcoin. Uh, it, uh, that, that's what was really missing from the picture of these ransom Trojan attacks. And when they figured that out, they've made a killing with all kinds of ransom Trojan attacks. We're taking a moment to drink. So, same yes. to you, sir. Salute. We yeah. salute. Hold up mm. your, your bottle, Miko. Mm. Yeah, yeah, you can hold yeah. up his <laughs> much larger <laughs> bottle. <laughs> Nothing well, like cocktails. At, he well, is, at, like he is at the, the office. There it is. Yeah. Is that the Joff me off? This is the, the Joff. Yeah, this is the Joff. I don't know Otherwise known as the Dirty Vespa, I believe. Yeah. I, when I make it, it doesn't taste that good. <laughs> no, I tried. That's and, why and, you're uh, not behind the bar. I, I, <laughs> I, exactly. I, I didn't manage to Joff around with the Joff Me Off very successfully. This yeah. is and people said, are you Joffing? I said, no, you're not. I'm, my Joff Me Off sucks. Mm. <laughs> but Apollo's doesn't. <laughs> so, yeah, Apollo uh, does a Miko, fantastic job. Well, well, I would you, like to thank AV Comparatives out of, um, <laughs> for, for sending us this bottle of uh, water for uh, our labs. So there that's you go. <laughs> <laughs> So, Amiko, you did a lot of analysis of Stuxnet, and I don't, you know, I, there's been a lot said about Stuxnet. But what I want to know is your opinion on what do you think the next Stuxnet is going to look like? Like, what virus is going to come out, or malware, that's going to be like, oh my God, I thought Stuxnet was bad? Like, look at this. Well, we still consider there to be a time before Stuxnet and time after Stuxnet. That's how, how big an event Stuxnet was, and it continues to be the only one of its its kind in many ways. It's still the only one we've actually analyzed which did successfully do physical damage and, and break things. Mm -hmm. um, but I suppose the, the worst nightmare scenario we had around five years ago when we found Stuxnet and, and spent the summer analyzing it, that nightmare scenario hasn't happened. And that was the scenario where you would have copycats by completely other sources, completely other actors, 
finding a copy of Stuxnet and modifying it to do different kinds of damage. Because repeating what Stuxnet did is very hard to do. It was a multi-million dollar project. And just programming these Siemens PLCs, it's, it's, it's very hard to do. Very few, very few people have that expertise. But if you would just take Stuxnet itself and modify it, not to target the Bush rear nuclear enrichment plant in Iran, but to target any plant anywhere in the world which is running on Siemens gear, and then instead of modifying these high-frequency uh, systems which were spinning the centrifuges, you would just have it do random modifications in random plants. Well, that would be pretty bad. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what we were worried about five years ago, and five years have passed, and we haven't seen that. No, kind of on that note, you look at Stuxnet, you look at Flame, you look at Dooku, there's almost like a kind of like, it feels like these are somewhat connected, right? You mm -hmm. had the digital code signing certificates from Reltec and JMicron in, in, in Stuxnet, and then you had Dooku stealing digital code signing certificates. Are you starting to see more of what you think is like, you, you see malware and you're like, this looks like it's part of a larger campaign that's going to be a piece to a puzzle later on? Yep, and we are trying to put these puzzles together. In fact, we just last month released a... 40-page white paper on one operation, which we call the Dukes operation, which consists of research we've been doing for several years, and the actual operation starts already in 2007. And right now we have nine different malware families with multiple subvariants in each family, which we are able to tie into this particular puzzle. Although Duke, uh, or sorry, Duke is not coming from the same source as Stuxnet, because Stuxnet was written by your government over there in the United States. And, We're number uh, one. We're, oh, wait. <laughs> <I'm here>. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Duke is coming from the other end of the spectrum. It's, it's by the Russian government. Mm -hmm. Very um, cool. So uh, I want to talk, uh, go back to mobile malware, uh, Miko. What kind of mobile malware are you seeing today? And we've got a panel later on. And what are some examples of mobile malware being very destructive or being used to gain access to big corporations? Most of the mobile stuff that we actually see isn't actually what I would consider a security problem. It's far more common to have privacy problems mm. because of mobile, mobile malware or mobile uh, malicious applications, however you want to define them. Uh, and, and this comes from the fact that all the app stores, even on iPhone, it's full of these free apps, which we all know aren't free. They're trying to monetize themselves one way or another, and the most typical way is that they just collect the information, and send it out, and try to monetize on you, on your profile in one way or another. So that continues to be by far the most common problem we have on our devices. Then when we move to actual... Um, like real malware, malware which is which which is a security problem instead of a privacy problem. For example, on iPhone, it's still very rare to see real security incidents, and that's because it's such a restrictive model. Basically, mm -hmm. the security model on your iPhone is the same as the security model on your PlayStation or on your Xbox. It's a closed system. Android is much more open, and that's why we do see real malware on Android. But even there the likelihood of getting infected with something similar that, that you would get infected on your on your PC is still very rare. Yeah, that's interesting. Is it because of the monetization? Is it more difficult to monetize on a mobile platform than a desktop platform? In many ways, it should be easier to monetize because you can make phone calls, which means you can call premium rate numbers. And, uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. People use their mobile device to make a phone call? Yeah. <laughs> what, what weird concept, what right? What is a phone call? Yeah. What, what is it? <laughs> And the, the interesting thing about premium rate numbers is that uh, we actually studied three years ago this uh, whole pr like operations where they were making international premium rate uh, uh, dials or dialing premium rate numbers internationally. And that's interesting because in general, premium rate numbers do not work from one country to another. Like, for example, from Finland, I can't dial your... One nine hundred number. Is that one nine hundred numbers you have in USA? Yes, okay. I don't yeah. know. I, I get all my porn on the internet. I don't. Oh, okay. <laughs> but eight, yes, seven, they would seven. be one. Yeah, one eight seven seven and one nine hundred. When John yeah. wants to talk dirty, he calls me. So. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't be able to dial those numbers from Finland because there's no payment mechanism for premium rate numbers between oh, the operators between different countries. Mm. However, there are ways of getting around this. Um, and we've seen scams where people end up with phones dialing, for example, South Pole or dialing North Korea. And these are actual real numbers, which the area code really goes to those countries. And uh, this is called long lining. The, the, call, the calls actually never reach those countries, but they get billed as if you would have called a very expensive place. Did you just say the South Pole? Yeah. 
I didn't know you could even call the South Pole. I didn't even know. We're going to have to look into this. Can we find that number? We just need to find a South Pole number and call them on the show. Let's call them right now. Just to say, hey, you wait. What are you wearing? Somebody task that one on on the research list. What time zone does the South Pole follow? All of them. All All of them. them. All of them. (laughs) When you actually walk from one research station to another in the South Pole region, you you might jump eight hours in time, even though it's walking distance, because they typically have their time zones in the homeland's time zone. Hmm. So you can walk in a circle and get jet lag even, instantly. Even better, Joff. <laughs> the Austra- the first Google hit that came up for that was the Australian Antarctic Division. Oh well, I should make the call then. Can we get him on the phone? <laughs> should call Let's and say call hi. Pizza delivery. Yeah, so, uh, Miku, we can send faxes. Mika, you said that uh, privacy concerns are probably uh, more concerning, if you will, than uh, malware. What, in your mind, are the number one privacy concerns with respect to your mobile devices? Probably having just your contacts stolen, which happens very, very commonly. And with very many apps, both Android and iOS, will ask you to get, gain access to your contacts list. And of course, there's a reason why they want to do that. They want to collect your information and use it for, for something that they can make money out of. Mm-hmm. And uh, it is just. Uh, are they just building building an email list from your contacts list, or are they using it in some other like smarter way? You no, know, that's one way. But there's probably just marketing in buying and selling phone number lists. Phone numbers uh, have become very valuable. Uh, and, and we can see this even in, with companies like Google and Twitter and Facebook and so on. I mean, one of the reasons why, for example, Twitter is asking for your mobile phone number is not the two-factor authentication. It's it's for the purpose of um, connecting your Twitter account to con- consumer spending information, which is the kind of databases Twitter is buying from uh, database companies like you know GPG or Acumetrics, which create these databases of consumer spending, which is something they collect from the real world. So, so Twitter how, do is they, buying... how do they know what I buy based on my phone number? Well, these we, well, these companies like Acumetrics and GPG are generating dossiers on on consumers, which they buy from credit card companies and insurance companies and frequent buyer clubs, and many of those have your mobile phone number because that's what you put in when you register for these services. Or when you're at the register at checkout, they ask you for your phone number. Yeah. Happens that way as well. And, and the, the importance of this is that when Twitter or Facebook or other companies like this buy your spending information, like you know, what kind of clothes are you buying, yeah. uh, and, and, and then, then they can connect the real-world spending information to your Twitter account because they know your mobile phone number in the real world and mm-hmm. in the online world. And, and that's one of the reasons why when you go and buy an ad on Twitter or Facebook, you, 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 you have surprisingly detailed information about the users because not all of that information is coming from the services themselves. So for example, the Twitter ad interface yeah. will let you target your ads based on like how much money you make a year, what kind mm-hmm. of credit cards you carry, what size clothes do you buy. Is, hmm. is, that, is that all bad, Miko? I mean, the, if the end result is me as a consumer or user of these applications, I see ads that are pertinent to me. That in itself isn't bad. But what are some of the darker sides to that uh, privacy violation, so to speak? So Twitter knows what kind of booze do you buy and how much booze do you buy. So Which, does anybody that watches this show. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Next. We give that away for free. They know well, I buy a lot of cigars. Okay, well, so does anyone that watches this show. Related to that, or maybe just a, a different angle on that, you brought up credit cards and, and, and payments. Mobile payments in the United States is becoming a big thing with Apple Pay and what is it, Google Pay and Samsung Pay. Uh, have you seen anything, or what are your concerns, or do you have concerns about mobile payments and mobile payment applications? Well, most of the mobile payment systems are still hooked to a physical thing, like you have an NFC or something else on your phone, and you actually have to physically be there to use your phone to do the payment, which is good because it narrows down the amount of attackers. It doesn't make it impossible to attack you, but now the attacker can't be in Argentina. The attacker has to be physically there, or the easiest. I mean, the most attack venues are are reliant on somehow modifying the payment terminal, and that needs the attacker to be there. And that, of course, narrows down the amount of risks we have because you don't have to worry about all the hackers everywhere in the world. So, so uh, you know, wait, hold on. I want I want to go go back. So, if I see ads that are pertinent to me, again, other than buying booze, like what's the negative side to that, Miko? I suppose the bigger picture is that 
we are the first generation which is living their lives like this. Mm. We're the first generation where we can be actually tracked throughout our lives about everything we do. Like, where are we physically? Who do we communicate with? What do we communicate above? To some level, even what we think about. I mean, think about what you... Think about the secrets you tell to Google search. I mean, we make yeah, searches about kind of topics that, that, that nobody, that you would never dare to ask a living person. Like, you know, should I tell my girlfriend I'm cheating? People ask that from Google. They really <laughs> do. You, know, I mean, you go and do, do, start typing questions like this to Google, and Google's autocomplete will fill it out for you because so many people have asked the same question before you. And, and, and that's kind of scary because it's sort of like we're guinea pigs. We're like test subjects. The whole generation is being exposed to this kind of tracking and we don't really understand what it means i, I hope it's going to turn out okay but it worries right. me that um, it could actually be something that we don't really understand on this actual note one of the more yes. interesting things that i found was during the edward snowden uh, leaked documents was the x key score system which actually used tracking cookies for advertising and social networking to identify people on the internet so as your phone or your, your laptop you go to these sites you're shooting out these cookies they're just sitting there sniffing them and now they know exactly who you are and they can follow you around. So that's a very good example of a negative side to, right, to right. advertising. And, and So this kind of feeds into a question I wanted to ask. Um, it, it, what is the most, like the scariest trend that you see? I mean, we all have things that mm. keep us awake at night and we think about it. Um, personally, for me, it's clowns. But uh, whenever you're looking at the, when you're I looking at the a creepy clown, I somebody think get a red balloon. What, what, is, what is the most disturbing trend that you're seeing uh, right now? I suppose it's the long life cycle of factory automation gear. So PLCs, and, and we, we touched upon Stuxnet over there, and there's been a huge amount of increase in security in the, in the factory automation gear since Stuxnet, which is great. Unfortunately, it isn't going to help us anytime soon because big big amount of this gear has a uh, life cycle of 20 years or 25 years, which means even if you have perfect... Uh, security in, in, in stuff that's being sold right now, we are still going to have horrible security in our factories and power plants and food processing plants for a decade or so. And that worries me. You know, it's not only, uh, just, it's not only the long lifespan of industrial control systems, it's the operational imperative to keep them online all the time. So the, the actual uh, opportunity to even remediate the vulnerabilities is such a small window um, that, you know, it becomes this enormous concern because they have to be up and running all the time and there is, you know, only so much in the way of redundancy in these systems. I can't actually follow Dan Tentler on Twitter anymore if I want to get some sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Miko, speaking of Twitter, what, um, what happened with your Twitter account? Was there some drama surrounding that a few years ago? Yeah, yeah, I got banned, um, which is which was an <laughs> interesting experience. I recommend that to everybody. <laughs> we, we, we try. We, we try yeah, we, every we, day. We follow suit. We were banned from YouTube for a while too. So good all times, right, what, good times. Ben Jackson and I have had more Twitter accounts banned from Twitter yeah. than I can shake a stick at. So what, what was the re what was the reason that they banned you? Uh, it was a little bit weird because at some stage, three years ago or so, close to four years ago, I guess, um, they uh, they installed a phishing filter, which would like automatically block bots which were sending out tweets with links to bad websites like phishing sites which is obviously that's a good idea for some reason they um, enabled it to also scan back to history to go oh. back to old oh, tweets no. and find find tweets which had you know tweets to phishing sites and two months earlier i had tweeted a warning about a phishing site saying mm -hmm. you know here's a phishing site which claims to be myspace of all sites a myspace phishing <laughs> site and, uh, and they, of course, the robot found that and figured out I, I was a bot trying to get people into phishing sites, and it automatically banned me for uh, six days or so or something like that. Eventually, I did get my account back. But I, uh, I'll send you a link to the original tweet so you can put it in the show notes. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, we were banned or for we you. could tweet it. Well, we we could retweet yeah. it. <laughs> yes, yeah. right. Now, Miko, it's interesting. We were banned from YouTube for a while for the same thing, essentially. We were identified as, as spam or misleading content that you know would lead to spam kind of thing. Um, uh, how concerned are you about the Facebook, Google, Apple, Twitters of the world really controlling the types of content that you're posting to the internet. Quite worried and sort of as a European, I'm also quite sad because um, the web was invented here in Europe, was invented in Switzerland of all places. Yet 
we Europeans have been unable to create any services that anybody would use there. I mean, n- none of you guys never use anything out of out of Europe. You might use Spotify. Does anybody use Spotify? No. No, no, we don't use Spotify. What is, no. We use Linux. We, we, we <laughs> tell our children. <laughs> Linux. <laughs> Linux is the, we tell our children whenever they start using it, don't use that. That's European. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's kind of sad from my perspective that, you know, the whole world, especially we here in Europe, we use, you know, the Facebooks, the Googles, the Twitters, the LinkedIns, and, and our operating systems are made in the United States. Pretty much everything we do is made in the United States, and everything we do online is made in the United States. Even though Europe is larger, we have more people, we have bigger budget than the United States, but we are unable to innovate. We're unable to have real uh, dent on the web. And, and that's especially bad because your privacy laws give us no rights. So uh, if you're worried about the NSA, well, we should be worried twice because we have no nothing to protect us. When we go and store our <coughs> files in US cloud or make Google searches, your intelligence agencies are perfectly free to do what the hell they want with that information. Look well, at it, save it forever, and that's perfectly legal. Well, remember, if you don't do anything wrong, you have nothing to worry about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's hard to say that with a straight face. Yeah. Drink, Sorry, everybody drink. Everybody drink. <laughs> <laughs> so sort of, along, yeah, drink. sort of along those lines, do you have any thoughts or opinions about the recent uh, um, European Union court's decision about safe harbor and, and, and mm-hmm. data protection? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very, very important decision for the lawyers of the world. <laughs> <laughs> That's it? So they, okay. they figured out a way <laughs> to monetize. All right, well, I agree. Um, <laughs> okay. okay, so let's talk about ahead, the EU John. privacy directives. We already have Germany. Um, the German Federal Constitutional High Court has already ruled in some limited <laughs> cases that the European privacy directives are, are, are too, true, too stringent and not enforceable. Do you think that that's something that's eventually going to change across the entirety of the EU, or do you think that it's going to eventually going to change back? Because the privacy directives are a little bit tough for an organization to actually monitor their network effectively. How do we balance that privacy for people at work with the need to try and secure networks? Uh, it's a tough question. I um, honestly don't know. And and whenever I try to figure out what all these regulations regarding privacy mean and, and the, the, the various laws we have across Europe, I get a headache. It's 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 a nightmare, and I don't really know what this change in in safe harbor is going to mean. But seriously, it does mean that you know there's so many U.S. companies which used to have one set of rules to play with across the whole EU, and now they actually have to go and negotiate country-specific regulations in every single country within EU. And that's the reason why there are so many lawyers happy because there's going to be so many lawyers flying around Europe, paid for by American companies to get regulations passed in every single country. Mm. And that's what we do. Mm. Uh, sorry, I was just I was chatting. I was trying not to be distracted by the chat. Don't be distracted. I, Don't I, be distracted. I, I know. Keep I drinking. Keep the, keep I, I've got keep a drinking. really good computer for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Miko, on that note, there, there's a little bit of irony that, that as you were saying before, uh, many of the services on the internet that we use were developed in the United States, yet the EU has much more stringent privacy laws. What, in your opinion, is something that we can do here in the United States to say, give us some control back about what we're doing? What is something we can follow the EU model you think could help here in the United States? Well, first of all, have laws which would somehow protect us. So, for example, our laws here in Finland, when they speak about privacy, they don't speak about privacy rights for Finnish citizens. They speak about privacy rights for human beings. Mm -hmm. Which means that when you, let's say you store your files on a service being hosted here on Finnish soil, you guys would be protected because you are all human beings, I guess. We hope. Well, that's questionable for some of us. (laughs) (laughs) Some of us might be cyborgs, I don't know about that. (laughs) So moving away from kind of the country-centric laws to more of a universal look at how we actually use technology. I think that's interesting. Um. Miko, I wanted to uh, ask you about your thoughts on export grade encryption. You know, being uh, European, what are your thoughts on the uh, exporting encryption laws? Wassenaar has been on, in the headlines for the past six months now. Uh, it's actually a very old set of regulations. Um, back in the 1990s, when this company was still a startup, uh, one of the security tools we were building were encryption tools, including uh, SSH tools and hard drive encryption tools. Mm-hmm. And at that time, Vasenar was a godsend to us because it actually ex- uh, restricted what U.S. companies could export internationally, but it wasn't tying us. So we actually made a killing exporting 
uh, different kinds of encryption tools out of Finland to everywhere in the world when um, companies from the United States could only sell their encryption tools within the United States. And if they would sell it internationally, it had to be artificially weakened. Mm -hmm. You might remember when there were two versions of for example, Netscape, the browser, the U.S. Yep. version with secure yep. SSL and then the international with weakened encryption. Um, and those were the days. Oh, boy, I wish they would be back. <laughs> do, and, uh, do F-Secure make uh, an SSH? We, uh, we had our uh, we had F-Secure SSH, which yeah. we were set yeah. for yeah, 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 yeah. SSH, the protocol is actually uh, developed by a guy called Tatu Ylönen, who's also from Helsinki area. Who's, uh, Why are all the coolest called... tools coming from Finland? Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> Did you know IRC is from Finland as well? Jeez. It must be something in the water. <laughs> <laughs> Let's yeah. see that water. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Let's see that water. Uh, so yeah. do you still make the SSH? No, we actually only make security tools like in the, in the malware okay. area nowadays. We've got rid of everything else we do. Well, we do have, we have a VPN nowadays, a mobile VPN, which is, has grown to be actually fairly popular for people who... Uh, travel a lot or who want to secure their network uh, or their Wi-Fi access, for example. Uh, so uh, but but ahead, one, one, thing about, one thing about the export grade, though, um, now that we've seen so many calls for uh, regulations from, from, uh, for backdoors or for not using strong crypto, especially the UK politicians love to boast about this, um, <laughs> I'd just like to note it for the record that when you make it illegal to use secure tools, in order that because you want to somehow restrict what criminals are doing hmm. it's good to know that criminals are breaking the law already mm. and, <laughs> and when you pass a law to make it illegal to use secure security criminals will not care they will break that law as well so you're only going to restrict what law abiding people are able to do yep when you outlaw x only criminals will have x there we go yep <clears throat> so um <clears throat> moving back to uh, privacy and tracking do you believe end users are aware of tracking such as the yellow dots, and do they choose to ignore this? Right. Um, yellow dot. You mean the printer yellow dots that I spoke about in some of my TED Talks? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Do those really exist, pretty... or is that just in Hollywood movies and TV? They actually exist. Um, they exist mostly those... in Finland. <laughs> <laughs> it was developed. It's interesting. It was actually developed an interesting in Finland. conspiracy. You can look at printers from Japan, from South Korea, from, from IBM, and they all have the yellow dots. So yellow dots are automatically put on by color printers when you print uh, any page, and they can be later figure, used to figure out who printed it or which printer printed which paper. And this is very, uh, this reminds me of the kind of. Uh, registrations you had to do in the old East Germany, the, the Soviet East Germany, where you had to register every typewriter so you, they could figure out if yes. somebody had wrong kinds yes. of thoughts, they could track down who had the wrong kinds of thoughts. And that's basically what we're doing with our printers today. And the question was, do people know about this? No, they don't. Uh, exactly the same thing that even if they do, they will ignore it. Um, people always click yes i agree on everything even yeah. if they actually they shouldn't agree and if they would actually read through and understand the legalese in any eula they would never agree on that Does and we know this because we actually tested this last december we set up a wi-fi hotspot in london which would give people free access to to the internet and of course you had to click through the f secure end user license agreement to get free internet access and we embedded this clause about uh, how you have to give your firstborn child to F-Secure. <laughs> <laughs> so now convert the, convert the Faraday cage room into the nursery. So you have the <laughs> yeah. now become a daycare center. <laughs> and they all click yes anyway, right? So. I'm pretty sure I, I, daycare we, was invented in Finland as well. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm really sad we didn't go and pick up the kids. We should have gone and pick up the chickens. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, they were contractually oh. bound to it, I mean... Yeah. So and, and if you had no kids, then you had to give your favorite pet to F Secure Corporation. <laughs> <laughs> that would actually probably generate more of an uproar. <laughs> just, just, just make sure that you have enough cat oh, carriers. Oh, you oh, want my kids? <laughs> I don't even have one. <laughs> so, Mika, what's, what's your or favorite uh, classic arcade game? How does that? Are, are you like big in the classic yeah, arcade game? Yeah, I gotta ask. I, yeah. You guys mentioned it at the. What, yeah. What's the background on that? Well, I mentioned Xevious. Um, I collect old games. I have a small collection of full-sized uh, coin operation games. Me too. Games. <laughs> oh, yeah, excellent. I, which years are you collecting? Uh, so not so much years, more memories. Um, right. So Donkey Kong Jr., uh, Pac-Man, uh, Altered Beast, and uh, Space Invaders are the, the ones that are currently in operation. The other ones are being restored. 
Right, right, right. Yeah, I have Space Invaders as well. I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on the golden years, so 1978, 1983. Okay. I have, oh, I, yeah, yeah. They, they were eight. good years. Yeah. <laughs> so my favorite game is Xevious from Namco 1982, which mm -hmm. is a mm -hmm. uh, shooter game. Uh, really, really great graphics, really great game. I still haven't really... I haven't uh, finished the game. There's, there's no way to actually finish it, but you can play it long enough that it can be considered to be finished. It but, just gets um, tired. <laughs> <laughs> when, when your hands fall off, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're, you're finished. The, uh, then I would also... Uh, I really like, like my Defender. Defender and the sequel. Oh. Which is oh. game. Really, really good. However, lately I've probably been playing more pinball than my video games because I, uh, I used to have a Terminator 2 pinball which I sold in the summer and I sold it to make room for, for, for a new pinball and for, for the first time in my life I bought a brand new pinball uh, which was shipped straight to me from Chicago from, from Stern and it was a great feeling to open up a crate mm. which had a brand new pinball zero place and you, you plug it in and you turn it on and then you have an envelope with unplayed balls and you put them uh, on the play field and <laughs> start got, I've got to do that that sounds really good and all, add to bucket list yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the pinball is Metallica which is pretty good pinball and it plays the original songs as well so uh, I've, I've been playing by Metallica a lot lately if Very you're nice. getting into pinball you need to find old original Williams machines they're the best uh -huh. Well, my Terminator 2 was a Williams, yes, uh, yep. and I agree. Yep. But, but um, and, and Stern for many, many years had a bad rap, but actually nowadays the new Sterns <coughs> are surprisingly good. They just had a remake of the original um, Williams uh, Medieval Madness, which is now oh. a remake built by Stern. And it's Guys, perfect. was I not mentioning Medieval Madness <laughs> last night? Yes, yeah, you it, were. It, it, a new one is In like In between 12, your 000. wailings about not having a cat carrier. Paul doesn't get this. We'll have to tell it later. <laughs> we're gonna let it go. I know yeah. all the characters involved. So I can just, yeah, yeah, we're just gonna smile and wait. Yeah, so, so Miko, I, I've taken a, I've taken a step back and I've actually gone back to instead of going forward in the new stuff, uh, backwards into the electrical electrical mechanical stuff. Wow. So 1960s, um, and wow. I have uh, three unrestored machines sitting in my uh, workshop now that I just need to make time for, um, and I've got one halfway torn apart, and uh, it's halfway torn apart. I got to remember <laughs> how to put it back together now. <laughs> yeah, this I have. Lots of friends who are into old pinballs, like pinballs from the 50s and 60s, and that's a completely different world. Oh, yeah. But, uh, you know, it, and when you have an old game like that, you spend 50% of the time fixing it and 50% of the time playing it. And mm, that's why yeah. I like my new Metallica, because it's, it's going to last forever. When it's yeah. not in a bar, but it's in your house, <laughs> it's going to yep. last forever. So I like yep. it. Yep. Yeah. And, and for me, that's the, uh, you know, my. my Peers have always said, and bosses have always said, have a hobby that's non-technical. Right. Well, for me, that's the the arcades and the pinball. There's some technical stuff, but there's also some woodworking and some electronics yeah. and and all of that stuff going along with that. So that's. I, my let bad. me tell you. A, let me tell you a story. When I I bought a Battle Zone, uh, Atari Battle Zone uh, tank game uh -huh, with, uh -huh. with vector graphics, and uh -huh. I bought it from Stockholm, Sweden, and uh -huh. I had it shipped over from Stockholm to Helsinki, and that's a boat ride. So it was put on a boat in Stockholm, and it was. Uh, shipped to here and as they were unloading it a forklift drove through mm. my battle zone oh, oh, no. which, which wasn't very nice uh, i was lucky though that the screen survived and the pcbs survived it was mostly just the cabinet, cabinet. Yep. which was destroyed so i, I had it insured though and uh, i i had a long nice discussion with the insurance company about what was broken and i was explaining to them that this is actually antique that you, you broke an antique Mm -hmm. machine and they were claiming that of course it's not antique it's from 1979 and i actually had a official statement from a professor which would from a local university and he he proved that yes it's not very old it's only 30 something years old but it's a classic of its time it's rare it fits all the the properties of a real antique machine and they uh, refunded me as as it would have been an antique so i had it restored by a professional and i have a have a brand new battle zone with a brand new cabinet Oh, that's really excellent. Cool. Good, good Little ending known to the story. historical trivia fact: pinball was actually invented in Finland. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't. It was invented in Chicago. <laughs> my, my favorite detail about pinball history is that when pinball was invented, they they had pinball machines made for maybe a decade, until they invented the flippers. Ah. I kid you not. For the first yeah, decade, it used to be you just shot the ball and you watched it bounce around and drop. Yep. Right? Game of chance, yeah. not a game yep. of skill. Then, and they made one pinball called Humpty Dumpty, which actually had the flippers, which you could flip, and it was a massive success. And since then, they only made pinballs with flippers. Hmm. 
That's so cool. <clears throat> Any other questions for Miko? Before we get to the five questions. The, the big five. The I, big think, five. I think we should go straight to the big five. Let's, Let's go, go straight, for the big five. five. Miko, are you ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? All right. Three words <laughs> to describe yourself. Three words. I only need two words. Um, alpha nerd. Alpha nerd. Oh, if you nice. were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Mojitos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, All right. That is officially the best <laughs> answer in 10 best. years. Maybe I guess. That's a no, that's that's water. Go. What's that? Nobody suspects, nobody suspects foul play when somebody dies out of mojitos. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> if you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? I would quote Shaggy in my title. It wasn't me. <laughs> in, the, in the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Are we speaking about professional or amateur Ask Grabby Grabby? <laughs> well, only, wow. only, only, only professional here. <laughs> only I'm sorry, we don't we're, do we're all professionals. This is the American version of Ask so Grabby Grabby. So it's amateur. So it's amateur. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty sure Ask Grabby Grabby was invented, also invented yeah, in Finland. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go for first. Okay. Uh, He's going first. Miko, man. choose two celebrities to be your parents. Um, I suppose my role model um, and, and someone I've always looked up to has always been Tony Stark. Nice. Oh. Mm. All right. So, so my father would be St Tony Stark, also known as Iron Man. And, uh, and my, um, my mother probably would have to be... Um, Taylor Swift. <laughs> oh. T-Swizzle. I love it. We were close. My, mine was uh, Robert Downey Jr. and Betty White. So we were along the same lines, right. I think. I don't know. Clearly, you do not have mommy issues. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little early in the day to talk about our mommy issues. Miko, I want to thank you very much for appearing on Security Weekly, helping us celebrate uh. our 10-year anniversary uh, in, in doing the interview with us and sharing your knowledge. It was fantastic. All right. Thanks. You have a great one, guys. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks Miko. Miko. Thanks, Miko. What a pleasure. With oh my that, gosh. yes, absolutely. That was awesome. Uh, we're going to take a short break. Uh, there's actually going to be uh, pre-recorded stuff that's going to happen for the, the next little while. Because it's our 10-year anniversary. we got to drink more. Well, we have to drink more. And I wanted us a chance to relax and want to actually talk to each other. Because when we do this in the, in the past, our schedule is so booked. Like, we get through the end of the day. We're like, wow, I really didn't get a chance to talk to anyone here yeah. in the studio. <laughs> I know, right? So I've, uh, we pre-recorded <coughs> pre an interview with the Loft panel. Um, so why don't we do this? Why don't we do a, a short break, come back. We're going to run a sponsor ad. After that sponsor ad, I'll come back. I'll introduce the panel a little bit. We'll get right into it. After that, you're going to hear uh, five questions montage, throwback clips, and listener voicemails uh, during the lunch hour. So there's plenty of great content coming up. I'll be right back. <laughs> 